All right. Thanks for having us here today. I, you know, I've been fine all day, no pressure really, until I see the participants keep coming in. Um, there are a lot more people in this session than when I've presented in the past. So anyway, still excited to be here and excited to present with Ken. Um, we've been able to connect through the TCOM Collaborative and uh, it really has been a fun story connecting um, our work here in Kentucky and learning about Ken's work. So um, just a brief introduction. I am Lizzie Minton. I work here in Kentucky um, and I've been part of our TCOM implementation through use of the CANs um, for the past five years. So we'll talk a little bit more about what that work looks like, but I'm gonna let Ken introduce himself before we get started. Okay, well, thank you, Lizzie. I, I'm Ken McGill. Um, I've served my entire career in New Jersey, uh, the last 17 years supporting New Jersey's children's system of care. Uh, the last 12 was the uh, lead and only CANS trainer statewide and the wraparound child family team trainer and um, for the last eight years and trying to connect the two was, uh, was a goal. I'm now out in California, but although <laughs> I'm sitting in Pennsylvania um, at a company called Opica and uh, Kate Cordell uh, was one of the presenters today um, in terms of just how do you connect it and, and how do you... Uh, use the data in real time. So for me, this is a this is quite an honor and, and to be presenting with Lizzie again, we did it for the Kentucky uh, System of Care Academy. So I'm, I'm a little nervous, <laughs> excited. Yeah, so this, this presentation, uh, well, quickly to fly through that, we don't have any uh, anything to disclose today, um, but we're talking a little bit about what the work that we've done in Kentucky and conversations that Ken and I have had, um, you know, the last several months, and this whole idea of moving beyond compliance, right, beyond certification and compliance, and echoing even what uh, folks from Tennessee said this morning, learning about their own implementation, and how, you know, we kind of get in that rut of, okay, well, are CANs getting completed? Are they getting completed timely? Um, but kind of takes us away from the real TCOM philosophy. And so this training, this session is really meant to be um, some practical ways to implement and use the CANs. How do we support and engage families? Um, we're not sharing a lot of data, um, no regressional analyses, or it's probably not even a real term. Um, it's been a long time since I took a statistics class, but really is, you know, how do we use uh, the CANs in the work that we're doing. Um, so briefly, in here in Kentucky, we have been implementing um, a screening and assessment process for children that are in out of home care. And so the CANs is our assessment tool that's completed by behavioral health providers. We have a screening process to determine which children uh, need a CANs and then a referral process to ensure that they're matched with uh, providers who use evidence-based treatment uh, to address trauma and other experiences. So um, if kids meet that clinical cutoff, then they're referred for a CANS assessment. And we started implementation in some counties in 2016. We are a um, statewide child welfare system. We have nine service regions and we implemented initially in a few counties at a time and then started to roll out the process by region. So we added every, uh, a couple regions every few months until we had full-scale implementation of screening and assessment in June of 2018. And so briefly looking at, you know, what did we do? I thought it was interesting to kind of think about what did we do last year? Uh, of course, in, even in the middle of a pandemic, we had more than 4,500 kids that entered out of home care on any given day. Um, right now, we have about 9,9100 kids in out of home care in our state. 87% um, of those kids had a screening completed, and about two-thirds of those kids screened in and were referred for CANS assessments. We have about um, 1,000 to 1,200 CANS assessments that are completed every month, um, which is great um, and exciting to see, you know, the work being done. Uh, I saw in the participant list, some of my uh, colleagues from Kentucky's Department for Behavioral Health are here, and I have to brag on them and their um, where the work is moving forward, uh, the folks from Behavioral Health through Kentucky System of Care and the System of Care 5 grants, they are expanding the screening and assessment process beyond the out-of-home care population to children in in-home cases, so kids that are affected by child welfare but remain in the home. 
um, and also through um, Hi-Fi Wraparound. So lots of CANS uh, even expansion building on the work that's been focused uh, on the out-of-home care population. So that's exciting. All right, uh, there's my brief history just to let you know what's happening here. Uh, but you know, we've all lived through the last, uh, what, 18 months now, and really, really, we're looking forward to being together, to gathering in person, having a sense of normalcy, and yet here we still are. Um, and so our world has changed, and because of the way that our world has changed, our work has to change. Um, so Ken, I don't know if there's anything you want to say about that. Well, just, I mean, it, it, it's amazing how quickly people shifted um, over um, to the, the, uh, the virtual platform and how, in many ways, the, uh, the barriers of, of access uh, to the child family team utilizing the, um, the CANs in a, in a more comprehensive way. So there have been some positives, but the impact on communities um, and, and the work, it, it's tough, especially for the newer staff. I'd be curious to find out who uh, in the uh, um, in the session are, are new to the field and started their current position during the pandemic because uh, prior to working at Rutgers and doing the, the uh, training and curriculum development at the Behavioral uh, Research Training Institute, I was a clinical director for a care management organization and I try my best to think what would it be like to do the, the, the work in home. Um, and I, I thought I had a pretty good imagination. I can't even imagine. Um, having to, to do the, the, the work uh, using the, the, the video platform. So um, do we have a lot of people typing away to see, are you brand new? So, so very quick, uh, we had this question, I believe it's gonna be for Lizzie. Uh, let's see here, oh, hold on. Computer's being odd. How do you determine which children's need a CANS? Hmm. So that's determined through screening. Their child welfare worker completes a screener within the child's first 10 days of entry in out of home care. And then based on clinical cutoffs, they're referred for CANS. We're actually presenting with some of our leadership from uh, Kentucky Department for Community-Based Services tomorrow, if you wanna hear more specifically about that process. I guess like a stay tuned, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> in New Jersey, they do the CANS uh, for the entering into the system of care and a child and family could enter in um, with systems involvement, no systems involvement whatsoever. And the, um, the, the strength and needs is done um, as part of a biopsychosocial, and that'll determine what level of care and whether the care management organization along with the family support organization um, goes in and does wraparound. So it really is uh, very cool. And if there's anyone from New Jersey on the call, you can fill in a little bit more about that. Um, I think there are about 15,000 uh, uh, children in care management organizations for the 21 counties, uh, but that's that's a dated number. Um, given that I'm a Californian, <laughs> so I'm seeing the uh, chat room pop up. Um, it's uh, it's being lit up. I, I like hearing all of the different applications, right? And that's what I mean. I talk about in Cairns training that we, the CANS is used internationally and it's used differently in every jurisdiction, right? I don't know two people that do it exactly the same. And I, I think that's one thing that we appreciate about it, so. Absolutely, absolutely. We have the, I think the Lacey Davis, Dr. Davis said this, he did, uh, the family support organization will do the uh, family assessment of needs and strengths. And we have a crisis assessment tool used by mobile response. So the great concepts of, are, uh, they're the same in terms of its approach. Uh, community metrics are, you know, the tools find out what's going on and, and uh, through conversations. And so it's, it's a little more challenging to do it this way. But again, some people, um, you know, the technology is, is very comfortable. And, and once you build that rapport, and that's, I think, what we're going to talk about uh, uh, moving forward, which is cool. Yeah. So talk, I mean, how we've used the cans, whether it's in home, out of home, every kid, you know, just some, some kids, some families. Um, you know, it's all about right relationships, right, and having meaningful conversations. And I remember just in talking with Ken at one point, he, he, we were talking about the cans, and he said, you know, the whole point is that we're trying to develop trust, you know, so we can find out what's behind the need. And that has stuck with me, and I think it's a great um, description of the work that we're doing with, uh, I mean, I say kids and families, that's always been uh, my population of focus, but families, adults, you know, whoever it is that we're working with. Um, but certainly we have to build that trust, have meaningful conversations, relationships, so that we can, you know, find out what's happening, what is beneath the need. 
Absolutely. And when you say that, you know, some people who are not forthcoming in sharing might because of the not feeling comfortable or not knowing where that information is going to be going. So in Kentucky, having child welfare, uh, people might be a little leery so that they don't want to get themselves in trouble or, you know, and, and I always recommend it or when, I, when someone did share something that was about safety, or abuse and neglect concerns is that we're all about keeping everyone safe. And if we have to make that phone call, we'd love to make that phone call with you because uh, child welfare is not a punishment. It's to make sure that everyone is, is staying safe and you're getting those resources that you need. And Ken, again, I'm going to let you talk on this one. Sure. And, and I, 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 with the care management organizations, the care managers, the family support partners, um, they said it was really tough um, in, in starting out and, and, and doing the work in a more virtual fashion. And a lot of the conversations began to um, uh, spring with wearing a mask. In New Jersey, there was a sheltering in process where we could not leave other than going for essential food. Um, <laughs> We were running around scrambling for toilet paper. I don't know if other country, other uh, states throughout the country were dealing with that. Um, that and wipes. Um, it's funny, uh, uh, the spam is still on the shelf or other things. Uh, um, but the, the 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 fact that that was a a conversation starter. How are you doing? Um, and then what really um, uh, built some of the relationships were that since we were doing our sheltering in at home, uh, we were testing our internet. I found out my internet was not necessarily the best but was also involving my uh, son. And then we had our grandkids with us. So they were on uh, you for school. And then, um, you know, so that the, the dog going into the, <laughs> the frame uh, uh, while you're talking. And I, the, the best thing that uh, happened to me was early on when uh, I was upstairs and eventually I was told I was too loud. I went downstairs and then eventually the front porch and then the back porch. And if it continued, I think I would have been out in the yard but I remember my grandson who came, came upstairs and uh, he was just being potty trained. So when he shared his uh, success in the, in the potty, um, it, my training was, was, uh, was shifted. People were laughing, but there was someone said it just felt like it, it, was, an, it was an equaling, like everyone's going through this. And um, I thought I was the only one. And uh, um, so that, that, that training in particular, uh, there was a lot of sharing. So making sure that we're still having that real connection, even though we're doing it maybe in, uh, in a virtual world or a hybrid fashion. And remembering that there have been families like Dr. Davis said, um, who were struggling before COVID and now with things even uh, um, uh, expanding and continuing for, some, for, for such a long period of time, having food insecurity, losing jobs or being underemployed or, or uh, unemployed um, in this process, uh, recognizing that things might have changed, even if the family has been open with us for a while. But I absolutely love the fact that people have shown that if, if we can be creative and comfortable around the uh, ambiguity, um, if you let that happen, and the, the last presentation I sat in was around social or emotional learning, and um, the, the presenter, Douglas, was mentioning that it's okay to be um, in this silence, <laughs> be comfortable with that, um, is, is a really important thing. Um, I don't know if, if people have felt that there's been a, a more positive way of doing the work or some of the challenges other than internet bandwidth. Was there anything that people want to share about um, um, other than my, my grandson's potty story in terms of building that rapport with those that you're serving? And um, oh, Emily said she has the potty. Oh my goodness. It really does normalize the, you know, um, the experience. And what it does is it gets us on, the, on the, the same page with those that we serve because it is a relationship that we're developing. It's not a power struggle or shouldn't be a power struggle. And when we're doing wraparound, um, it really becomes a, an avenue. Uh, pets, um, some of the family support organizations, when we were doing these trainings or their outreaches, they were doing it in their, um, uh, when the weather was nice out in their gardens. So when they were sharing some of the things that they were doing to keep themselves calm and, and uh, moving forward, uh, it built the relationship, the rapport and level of trust um, quicker because of this uh, um, season that we're calling uh, COVID continued. Uh, but the creativity and comfort around the ambiguity is really, uh, I've got some fast typers in here. 
I can't read that fast, Liz. I'm going to show you some of my my needs or strengths to build. Um, <laughs> Feeling safer in their own home, more open to talking longer during assessments, being able to help mentor more new workers over Google yeah. Meet. And I have to agree with the pet. I've had uh, some embarrassing moments with my cat in the background, which is why I prefer to have a, a fake uh, background. Uh, actually, he's walking uh, down here as I speak. So definitely um, know about that. Yeah, like to make an appearance during meetings. Very cool. Um, Christy, um, I think your hand is raised. Yeah, so um, I can say, you know, yes, it, my life is sort of like on display now, you know, like <laughs> my environment that normally would never be ex exposed um, during work or, you know, during the course of work is now exposed. And so that can be a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not even sure what it is, but I do know that I have felt like, um, you know, boundary issues or boundary concerns are definitely something like things have shifted a little bit. Um, whereas, you know, if I'm talking to a client and, you know, we tr you try as much as you can to like create an environment where you are in your professional, you know, space, but life goes on. You, your life is so much intersecting now with work that it has caused a lot of ripples, not only about now my stuff is exposed to the people I'm working with, um, both colleagues and clients, but also um, when does the workday end? You know, emotionally, how am I transitioning and all that stuff. So that's definitely been a shift and a learning curve. And I'm not even sure that I have found the right balance, but it's, it's a consideration. Now, see, when someone hears that and someone's new into the field and you're, you're, you've been doing this for a while, that's comforting to know that it just wasn't that, that wasn't, you know, me feeling that way. And, and again, being in the field for a while, hearing you say that for me is comforting saying, I, my gosh, I thought I was the only one. I should be able to handle this and know when to take breaks and, so very cool. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I felt the same way. I've, I've said, you know, I don't, I don't have an office to go to anymore. We've made changes here. Um, I am forever remote. And the, the hard thing is, even though I can walk away from work, I can end my work day, it's still there. You know, I can't, I unfortunately don't have an office. I can't just shut my door and leave it. It's kind of in a living space. And so that, that is a huge shift and also makes things more personal when working with clients. So is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? How do we feel about those boundaries? I don't know. Um, and, you know, I think um, someone said in the chat, telehealth has removed childcare and transportation issues. That's huge. You know, we have uh, many rural areas here in Kentucky, and that's what I hear from clinicians. We are able to reach more people, um, which is great, um, you know, but then at what cost? So making sure, like, there has to be a balance. So it, I don't think we will ever be all virtual, um, right? How do we find that balance of getting services virtually to people that need them, but also being able to use and take advantage of in person um, and being together? Absolutely. And I did a blog. Um, I really encourage you. Uh, yeah, we really encourage you to look at the tcomconversations.org website. There's some really great blogs in there, but the one that's not so great, but just kind of there, uh, it was one I wrote in terms of uh, the, using the cans for caring for each other. And I actually did a cans because I'm like, why do I feel so anxious going to the food store? Not even recognizing that was the food store that was was uh, um, early on. So um, there's there's wonderful blogs in terms of sharing. I'm going to keep us moving because when Ken and I did this presentation before, I think we had an hour and a half and ran out. And so today we're limited <laughs> to an hour. So I do appreciate the conversation in, in the midst of of uh, our world right now. So, um, okay, Ken, I'm gonna let you take this one too. Yeah, and this is actually just highlighting what we just did now. Yeah. We just listened to what was being said. We heard the language, what, you know, what was being the message, what was, we also connected with the feelings that were being shared as well. So I think this is just a reminder that is so important to when we're filling out the cans based upon conversations is we can plug it in something in terms of uh, overwhelmed at work or stress but we also need to recognize that it, it's part of the home environment. It's part of the, the maybe anxious, all the components that um, we're, we're trying to get at the common um, 
bottom line and using just basic straightforward shared language in this process. And if any folks uh, are, are uh, translating these tools in different languages, tell us how challenging it is to make a transition or a translation rather to uh, um, a, a language, you know, uh, um, such as Spanish or Portuguese or Tagalog or any other language that you're, you're, you're translating these tools. This is not easy stuff. It really isn't. So, but to, this is just a way to say, you know, making sure that we're all in agreement of what we're hearing and that's how the CANS tool works. It's so important. And I know we all know, right, the CANS tools, this is a way to help us gathering information the way that we're documenting this so that we have what we need to help others, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, always talk to people in CANS trainings and tell them, because sometimes they'll get overwhelmed. They'll say, oh, you have 80 items or, you know, whatever it is. I'm like, yeah, but if you're, if you are doing a good job, if you are doing a thorough assessment um, and learning about the child and family that you're working with, it's not any new information, right? So this is just a way to help us um, gather our information, organize our thoughts and making sure that we have what we need to, to help, right? And so um, to kind of shift a little bit into some of that practical application, you know, we don't have time to delve into these questions that are on your screen, although I do think it's just really um, important to keep in mind, um, you know, when we talk about this in CAMES trainings, but how do we create the shared vision? Um, what does a shared vision even mean? Um, and so I don't know, just a minute in the chat pod, you know, maybe in your words, what does a shared vision mean to you? And how do we make sure that everyone has a voice in that? And those are really big questions. So uh, <laughs> don't expect too much here. Or you can unmute yourself, that's fine. Yeah. And really doesn't it determine like what types of positions we're holding? So child welfare isn't your charter to make sure they're looking at abuse and neglect concerns or looking towards permanency, you know, finding a forever home and, and permanent, uh, permanent placement a home for this, this uh, young person. So if that's an agreed upon shared vision, that's a great place to start. Yeah, safety safety goal, yeah. goal and well-being, right. See, yeah. I called Joanne up and we, 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 were, we were planning that. You talked Thank to her pastor beforehand. <laughs> Asking the family what they're hoping to get out of this. Yeah, no one is excited to have DCFS in their life, right? But how do we make the time worthwhile? Right, that's what, I mean, I try to remind clinicians when I'm training them, um, you know, it's not it's not a good knock on the door, right? It, people aren't happy that uh, we're asking all of these questions, that we're completing an assessment. That may be the worst day of their life. And here we come, you know, I'm the social worker and I'm going to help you um, by asking you a million questions and, you know, want to know everything about you. That, that may not feel good. Um, so how do we engage um, and, and make sure that they feel like their voice is heard? And so the next slide, you know, we have, who do we include, include in the shared visioning process? And I don't know about you all. <laughs> um, I know here in Kentucky, Ken and I have had some conversations. I think this has happened in New Jersey too. Um, I, I have a hard time with some of uh, the providers, the clinicians, the behavioral health folks that I've worked with, especially in child welfare, getting them to include families in the process. Mm -hmm. And um, there's probably nothing more frustrating. Well, probably some things, but but as a trainer, oh, um, yeah. being part of a conversation and somebody saying to you, well, we don't work with biological families. We don't do that. That's what the state does. Right. Um, well, I don't think you're right. Uh, and I'd like to talk to your supervisor. Um, what a disservice we do to kids and families by not engaging and not working with the family. Um, you know, so often people will tell me, well, we work with the foster, we only work with foster parents. And I'm like, well, that's not good enough uh, because it's our responsibility to help the child and the family achieve their goals. So Again, who, who should be included? Uh, you know, I have pictures here of just all different the kids, the families, whatever that family might look like. It could be extended families, um, you know, whoever is the, the supports for that child. Absolutely. <clears throat> and we're getting some really great all stuff right. in terms of voice and choice and, you know, children okay. within the So context. why why do we think, why it went difficult? Yeah. And I know I...
uh -oh. um, I say this and it's a little bit of I me. Mean, we all are here to help people. My I'm getting the connection is unstable. Are we good? Uh oh. So just another Any example. On that? Just how technology we have to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think engagement is difficult? Or do you think it is? Please feel free to raise your hand, answer in the chat, or just unmute yourself. I know a lot of people have mentioned this, they, what questions do you ask? Oop, someone. Um, because everybody's humans and have their own stories and their own needs and their own agenda and the roles that they play and trying to merge that together um, for a specific focus um, can be challenging. Mm -hmm. So, so um, that's Being why on the same page is what you're saying, Crystal. Is that, is that what you're... Right, it's hard having... to get... Yeah, it's hard to get everybody on the same page when I have a specific role, you have a specific role. We all have an, and but to get them to understand that we're, we all have an investment in the child and to agree on that, it, it's very hard to engage. And people, people need to be heard. So that's a balance that uh, someone in the team um, has to help facilitate. I love it. You just gave the answer because, again, if you agree upon that you're here to help the family, that includes the child, the parent, caregiver. We have one hand up. I think particularly in child welfare, um, it's hard to get families to understand that you know, we're there to help. And so building that trust with them can be really difficult, especially if we're looking at sort of a system um, that has, um, you know, these families that have perpetually been in the system, it, it's hard to sort of, um, change that mindset. Thank you. There's lots of good conversation in the chat um, as well around um, power dynamics, feeling like the system um, is judging them more than helping, afraid we can't control the process. System serves those that are willing and underserves those who are not. Um, that was heard in the pre-conference yesterday. Maybe engagement isn't so difficult, but it's difficult when we think of people as other, right? So maybe even coming from that, I'm the expert and um, looking at, at others. Family and youth don't always want any help or they feel nothing is wrong, right? And then the system is telling them something is wrong, but they may not feel the same. I don't know if do you, you ever get, um, Lizzie, does any, ever, any uh, families ever get uh, uh, court ordered to be involved with a voluntary program such as wraparound? We used to get those all the time, those court orders where we have to do it. Um, that yep. usually doesn't start the. <laughs> and that's what Rachel said. Biggest barrier with engagement is when counseling services are mandated by the court. Right. right. There's a reframe for that. that we've, uh, I don't think New Jersey uh, coined the phrase, but voluntold. So you've been voluntold to be part of it, but even though you've been court ordered, this is all about your family and um, shifting that around. This the time that we spend is all about working with you and you feel free to borrow that term. That wasn't, that wasn't a Jersey one. Yeah. Sometimes we don't really believe families are the experts on their own lives, strengths mm -hmm. and needs. Yeah. I, I agree. Sometimes we think we know what's best uh, as opposed to having that trust with the families. Yeah. And this is something borrowed um, from building bridges, but you know, what do families want? They want to have a voice. They want us to ask them what they think, to tell us what their goals are, um, what's worked, what's been tried, what didn't work. I shared, I think I shared this story when Ken and I uh, presented at a different conference, but I'll never forget. I worked in a, um, I was a, a therapist in a psychiatric residential treatment facility and worked with, um, girls ages like 10 to 14. And so they were, you know, coming into this program. And I'll never forget, I had this one young lady that was admitted, and she had had multiple um, long term inpatient hospital stays, um, significant mental health concerns. And so called her, her mom and said, I, I'm this, your child's therapist, I'd love to sit down and talk with you, learn more about your experiences, on and on. Uh, the mom said, sure. So she came and she uh, walked into my 
office with a stack of binders and notebooks and said, read this. And when you're done, we can talk. She <laughs> said, I'm not doing this again. Yep. I have told so many people our story. People are not listening. You want me to find a way to communicate with each other because I'm, I've said this over and over again. And nobody's listening. Nobody's helping. And so you can read my notes. You can read old therapy notes. And then when you're done with that, you can talk to me. And I was like, I, and I did. But I, the part I left out was that was my very first job as a therapist. And so I, you know, I was shocked. I thought, well, don't, why don't you just, maybe I'm different, you know, just talk to me and I can help you. Um, you know, but it was very eye opening that families are willing to share their story, but man, if you're not asking those questions about what has somebody else already tried, what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, and and being able to to really be part of that process, um, it was very eye opening for me. And thankfully, early on in my career, as a way to look at families and say, no, your voice is important. I know you've told this story many times, and let's find a way for you to have to stop. You know, maybe you won't have to tell it so many more times in the future. So. Thanks. That's a very. Important. I think the other thing that um, plays in is rapport takes time, engagement takes time, and I think somebody had said, you know, you build this over time, but um, within that building rapport, if you don't build trust, then having engagement at any point in the case process is just not going to work. I mean, it's difficult. To work really and time can be a luxury right we don't always have time to spend i mean of course that's important um but if you have to report to the court or you need to see progress yeah. quickly or you know whatever the restrictions are but you may not always have the luxury of of time Absolutely. no a lot of times you don't you know you're trying to gather information because you need to report it to other people but um you know, having that little bit of time goes a long way, I think. And Joanne has her hand raised. I was just okay. going to mention, too, I think that um, a lot of times when families do not engage with us immediately, um, we label it as a them problem, right? Like that they are, so now they're labeled as resistant or difficult. And um, the reframe I've been trying to make in trainings and, you know, in interactions with social workers is that like, they're not resistant. They're just not yet engaged. And that's on us. Like we have to figure it out. We have to approach it differently. And again, whether it's asking questions about like what's worked before, or like, what are your assumptions about me just in general? Like, you know what I mean? Cause like the reality is, is that they come in thinking some things too about they're not going to listen. They, you know, I've already done this a bunch of times. So like, again, those group agreements, how are we going to work with one another? How do we do things with families rather than to them or for them? And, um, but anyway, I always, I always just say not yet engaged. So if I hear the word resistant, that is my almost automatic reframe. That's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. I mean, I know how many team meetings I've sat in and people have said, well, they're resistant. I'm like, well, what are you doing differently? How are you meeting that? How are we trying to engage? Because no. it's not all on, you know, the, the client or the child, the parents, um, you know, yeah. we have to change our approach, yeah. um, not just say, well, they're resistant, they can't be helped. No, that's, that's not. Um, so I love that. Not yet engaged. Um, I may, cool. may steal that from you. <laughs> All right, man. Like, this time do is say it everywhere because I think we need to hear that. <laughs> we need to take yes. these labels yeah. off of families and really kind of own our role in the work instead of expecting that those who are voluntold to engage with us, yeah. you know, that's not always something that they want to do. And this is, it's on us to figure it out, not them. But when you make it about. And the, I think even my own personality. Hmm? Oh, sorry, Ken. No, 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 please. No, no. Go ahead. No, go, please. I say my, I'm, I can be pretty resistant, right? Somebody <laughs> tells me what I need to do. Anytime somebody starts a sentence with, you know what you need to do, or you know what you should do. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm like, I don't, I don't hear anything after that. And so to be a family, you know, the worst day and you have these people coming in and then you get labeled resistant because, you know, you're, you're not ready to tell them everything or be fully engaged. So, yeah. Absolutely. And our essence is never to do no, never to do harm. So we always want to make sure we're respectful and, and that's what families want. They do want dignity and respect. That's what everyone wants. Children as well. Yep.
All right, so here we are <laughs> coming down the roller coaster and just share a few things, you know, that, that could be helped to engage um, some strategies to help um, people, especially around the cans, right? So using the cans to create our shared vision, how do we um, introduce the concept? How do we uh, get families to buy into that? So first one, this is you, Ken. Yeah, this is, um, and, and this is uh, something that when you do wrap around and, and people are doing it really well and sharing within the system of care, but I love the TCOM uh, collaborative because when people have things they share, they say, here, this is what we use in, in our you know, state or our, our agency. Or, so this was um, a part of the process of, if you look at the, um, uh, the domain cards, they're part of the traditional wraparound. So what we did, and I, I think I see my colleague that from Rutgers on the, on the call, Karen Ray, we actually uh, embedded the cans tools that we use that you can actually click on if you give someone uh, control of the, of, the, um, uh, of the computer and they could rate themselves. And if you think about the, the main cards or cans within the life domain of a child, youth or family, so they, they have, if it's a child, then it's their home, school and community. And if it's an adult or caregiver, it's their home, work and community. And um, when we ask questions like how, uh, how are you doing with, with regards to everyone feels safe? Uh, are your, you know, at any times where you get anxious or any feeling of overwhelm uh, types of emotion? Uh, how's your overall health? Um, if you describe how your family's doing, let us know because you're trying to get some, uh, capture some um, picture of what's going on in the family. And then when you mention school, I don't know if this happens, but when I talk to my, uh, um, he's a junior now in, in high school, how is school? And I get, it's all right. I, I don't know if every school around the country is all right, but it seems like in small little Passaic County, New Jersey, that's what I get from my, uh, from my, uh, <laughs> my son. It's all right. So I saw flashcards. Yeah. Yeah. I was echoing your son. My, my kids always, it was fine. School is fine. Yep. Yeah. And I saw Crystal in the um, comments had made flashcards of all the items with the item on front um, and definition and questions asked on the back, put on a key ring. I love that where it's portable, accessible. We can pull that out in a session. And then, you know, on this, just sharing some, here are just some ideas, have fun. Um, you know, I've spent a long time working with kids and trying to find ways to incorporate this into practice. So, you know, I love, I love the Jenga tiles, um, writing, um, the um, item so right family functioning on the Jenga tile and then when you, if you pull that one out then you say how would you rate your family on family functioning let's talk about that why do you think it would be um you know a zero one two or three um dice you know maybe having two dice and you can go to the item number if you roll a six you know what's item six on your cans um and just being able to make it fun and create some kind of game out of it and similarly with like a deck of cards. And so, you know, I know that there are other people that use games um, and like to have fun. And so we can use that as an opportunity to engage. And I know I shared, um, I had a young man that I worked with, oh man, was he labeled resistant. Uh, this, this kiddo, he would come to my office, but he would not speak to me. And so he would not play a game with me. He was probably 15 when I was his therapist and would come sit in my office, but would not talk, would not even play a game. And so I tell him, you know, you don't have to talk to me, it's fine, but you gotta come, you gotta come hang out with me. And so over time, I just started to play solitaire. So we'd sit there, he'd watch me play. And then eventually, you know, he would start saying, oh, uh, you missed something. You could have put that card down. And then from there, being able to build off of uh, playing solitaire together, and starting to learn more. Okay, well now if I lay down a queen, then I want you to tell me about this part of your family or this part of your background. Um, you know, tell me about school. And so kind of being able to bargain and, you know, get that information where we went from a kid being silent to then being engaged just through doing something fun and trying to, to get them um, a little bit more involved. So, Absolutely. all right. I know we had the CANS conference in Texas, San Antonio, and um, the, during one of the presentations, they were using um, uh, emojis. So I, I didn't really figure them out. Uh, this was quite, this was quite a few years ago, I believe it was. And uh, I remember my my granddaughter when she was first born at a carnival. I, I was trying to win her <clears throat> I, what I thought was a pile of chocolate, smiling, 
And it turned out it was one of those emojis. It wasn't a pile of chocolate, but here she was holding this. Um, so when I see emojis in terms of the uh, zero would be a smiley face and then the three would be uh, the pile of chocolate. Uh, yeah, that was, I actually, I still have those cards from the conference in San Antonio. I think whoever made them uh, um, gave those out on a little packet and the yeah. zero, one, two, three with emojis on them. Yeah. And then the next slide, you know, this is another way, um, you know, shared from some colleagues, you know, just sharing resources, but, you know, being able to, to visualize what does it mean? What does a zero, one, two, three look like for needs and strengths? And so these are similar. You could laminate this or cut it out, um, you know, and be able, being able to say, maybe the kid doesn't want to talk, right? Well, you can say, well, how do you feel like you would rate yourself in um, with living situation or um, anger control and then being able to maybe just push the card we're going to share that with you so this is one that I, I really like using this too. is great um and then the next one Ken I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it back to you oh this is um off our website I, I put my email on there people if they want some of the things that I used uh in New Jersey or you know the the uh, uh I know Karen Ray's on the call as well uh will send you um Word documents of this so you can make it your own. But these are on the uh, OPEKA website, which is OPEKA.com, -E and they're skill sketches. This is a very creative way um, of identifying skills to build or needs to, to, uh, to meet. And this was uh, created by our um, co founder, Dr. Kate Cordell, who's also one of the um, uh, folks part of the larger U UK uh, team. And uh, so this, again, ways we can help um, to identify and make it an individualized care plan it doesn't have to be boring. Uh, it really doesn't. Um, thank you, Karen. <laughs> so visuals are helpful for some, you know, especially children who might be um, dealing with you know, have an intellectual developmental or just young or, you know what, they're just visual learners. They want to see so you can see where something starts and where, you know, it wants to be. So when it gets to be the blue or purple. That's where the third assessment might look like um, in this process. Yeah. So there's owls and different animals. And so be creative. This is a time I think using this virtual platform um, or even after the virtual platform might somewhat disappear. Um, but I hope it doesn't uh, for the rural, rural uh, families that you can get to um, some skill sketches. Yeah. And I love, I love the visual at the bottom, you know, looking at that change over time. Because we can print graphs and charts and things all day long with zeros, ones, twos, and threes, and you know arrows going up and down. But working with kids, this is a great way for them to see. Wow, you know my wolf has really changed. It's really evolved over time. Um, it, so I, I think that's that's really great. Um, I, when Ken shared this with me, I thought, man, I want to get that out there because. Um, I know a lot of kids that would, you know, have a much easier time engaging with something like this, right, than, than just a conversation. So, um, all right. Yeah, you can go right, into, <clears throat> right onto the website to get them now if you wanted to download them or I'd be more happy to send them. <clears throat> yeah, and there are tons. There are tons of different animals, not just the wolf, but, you know, lots of different things if you want to. If, if you have a kiddo that has a certain animal that they love in particular. And the, again, the impact of, of, of COVID or the uh, pandemic and the impact of, of, um, of just life and, and, and certain communities being isolated uh, because of, of um, impact of, of poverty or, or, or different types of violence. Think about when, when we look at um, social isolation from a framework that someone feeling lonely is not just not being alone. They could be in a room full of people. It's that feeling that no one cares. So the child going through throughout their day of school, well, they're in school, but we can find out who do they interact with in school. And loneliness is not just, you know, that feeling of being alone. It's that fear, depression, inferiority in terms of a collection of negative emotions that build up a wall, a massive wall around that person. So this is where finding out what's going on is what the CANS tools always do. It, that's all it does. And then come up with theory as to why this is occurring, especially with the families that we serve or the youth that we're serving, and then come up with a how we're going to work to meet that need. Um, that's what I love about the CANS. It doesn't tell you what you have to do. It finds out what's going on. Like Lizzie said, it finds out to you know, come up with a why, and that will lead you to a how we're going to get this done in a collaborative way. 
one more. Oh yeah. I think this, this kind of ties in, Ken. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I'm just going to say it's, it's. I've actually seen another presentation that brought the uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but I don't know when it became like it's not cool to bring in Maslow. I mean, um, <laughs> it's been around for a while, but when we think about foundational needs, um, like, like Dr. De De Lacey Davis said, if, if someone doesn't have food, they're hungry, you know, and not have a place to live, and they're going to be homeless or they are homeless. Uh, making sure we're getting to the foundational needs when we're really trying to build up and, and work on uh, the, the higher functioning needs um, is really, really important. Um, and, and some of the, the aspects. And this one was, uh, was something where if we just want to capture one or two needs, this was actually connected to um, uh, someone, a, a real person that um, um, it, it, the, the, they ended their life. That was the, uh, um, the outcome. Um, it was part of our, uh, this person was part of our small community. So if we were going to do the cans and looking at school attendance, uh, the school refusal being the number one and only need, we put a three down. But really, when you use the cans, find the, 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 what, the, the entire, uh, you know, layers of what's, what's going on. Why is this uh, young person not going to school? And the underlying need of this 13-year-old was they felt hopeless, um, when they were anxious at school, because again, uh, when they were going to school, they were being bullied. Uh, they had an IEP that really wasn't an individual edu education plan that wasn't being followed. And then given the, uh, the impact of the, the virtual learning, and then all these incompletes, because having a special education uh, in New Jersey, you couldn't fail, but they would just give incompletes, started piling up. So this person felt, again, more anxious that they had all this work in front of them. So... Um, when we think about what this CANS captures and some of the goals, this gives us a, a quick indication. No one should be bullied. It's actually, you know, it, it, it's, it's, there's the strongest harassment, intimidation, and bullies, uh, bullying laws that are on the books in New Jersey. So stopping, stopping bullying immediately should be the ultimate goal. Ways we can help decrease the anxiety of this 13-year-old. Uh, updating the individual education plan, monitoring the adherence so that we can help this, this person learn, this young person hopefully with the goal of increasing school attendance and academic success. And I share this with you because the CANS finds out what's going on. And this young person as a freshman in high school who had the hopelessness to, of wanting to end their lives, um, the work that you all do is so needed and, and, and so important. Um, and, and that's where this CANS helps to just to organize um, and make it more meaningful. Thank you for letting me to share. And this, oh, I forgot we put that in there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a plug for the TCOM uh, uh, blog, but there are wonderful blogs. They really are. So I really encourage you to look at uh, and read some of them. Um, but when we really think about, you know, utilizing the cans and the question I posed in this blog was, you know, given this un uh, unprecedented times or the time of stress that we're looking, you know, at uh, every single day of our life, what would a better day look like? And, and think about it now, uh, just before you, we wrap up here and go on to your next session, um, are, are, you, uh, you know, are you taking care of yourself? And then when you really look at connecting, you know, what, these are my current needs, these are some of the strengths I wanna build, this is what I wanna do um, to, to make my, my better day what it's gonna look like. And I think it's so important when we think about ourselves, taking care of ourselves so we can develop strength and we can, we can model for those that we serve. And then when we think about the work, it's ultimately to transform the lives of those that we serve, move towards the family vision, which this group, they understand it. They, they shared vision is so important. And I love this, right? Moving us from systems of care to systems that care. Um, yeah. It means that you don't have to love everyone we serve, but we do have to respect them. We do have to provide them with hope and we have to make sure that the time that we spend with them, we're hopefully building skills so they can empower, uh, be empowered in their lives and celebrate diversity. So education is the number one factor in, in, in uh, creating uh, equity, but also health equity, access to adequate health care, um, justice in terms of making sure that it's it's uh, it reparative and it's and it's building upon the uh, um, the reconnection of that individual within their communities. So I think that's so important. And I know we've all we've seen this visual, um, 
but help, you know, using the cans and the TCOM philosophy, shifting from, you know, a system where there's equality to equity to empowerment, right? We are not, um, we don't believe that everyone should be treated equally, right? We want to empower people, remove the barriers so that they can, um, you know, achieve their goals and be healthy, happy, successful without us in their lives, right? That is our ultimate goal, is that transformation that they're able to remove those barriers and, and be successful. So, you know, mm-hmm. just kind of thinking, how can we better use, um, you know, the cans, the tools that we have to support and engage families, um, you know, right, where it doesn't just have to be about this mandate that you are here and you this is an assessment, we have to do it. It's just, you know, I always say, you know, it's not a checklist and um, we want to use the information we're gathering to inform the work um, so that the people that we're working with can experience that transformation. So, beautifully said. 